Let's take a look at Titus chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 16. <clears throat> Titus 1, 10 through 16. And this is the complementary passage to what Don read in 1 Timothy. Paul says this, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of the people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciousness are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. We pray that you would help us now as we uh, set our minds to your word. I pray that you would, you would remove the distractions, the, all the cares of life, the things that, that uh, uh, bring us off balance. And I pray that we could focus on your word for the next few moments. I pray that you would uh, challenge us. I pray that you would encourage us, Lord. But I pray that you would point us toward you, toward Christ, toward the cross. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're getting back to our Titus study this morning. We've been, had a few uh, different holidays come up, and, and so we've kind of hit and miss, hit and miss, hit and miss on Titus. But we're getting back into that uh, this morning. Our last passage in Titus was the serious qualifications for godly elders. And, as you, and if you remember that passage, or you've read those passages in Titus and in 1 Timothy, the qualifications for elders, for church leaders... Is it's serious? Chapter two, which we haven't got to yet, opens with a serious call for righteous living, and right smack dab in the middle of those two passages, the qualifications, the serious qualifications for elders, and the serious call to righteous Christian living, we find this passage. Uh, these seven verses. It's one paragraph. This is one one thought unit. These seven verses are the reason for the serious qualifications for elders and the reason for the need for Christ followers to live righteously and seriously. I've said the word serious several times already. I'm going to say it a few more times, but that's, that's a big point to be made here, that we must take church, we must take our Christian lives seriously. The church must be serious because there are people that would deceive and abuse. And notice that Paul is talking about people that claim to be Christian. He says there are many, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, of the, especially of the circumcision party. He's talking about people that are within the church. They claim to be Christians. These aren't pagan Romans that are affecting the church. These are false teachers that are claiming to be one of the, uh, w within the body. This is important. <clears throat> These aren't outsiders. These aren't fiery atheists or people of competing or an antagonistic religious systems. Paul is concerned about false teachers, deceivers who don't care about wreaking havoc as long as, they, as, long as it benefits them. And I think if, if, it doesn't take long to look around at our culture and see false teachers who are willing to wreak havoc. You think, if, if, you know, the, the classic TV preachers, the Kenneth Copeland, the, uh, the Benny Hinn, who, those guys know what they're doing. They know they're scammers. They know that they're, they're, they're lying to people. And they don't care because they fly around in private jets and they wear Rolexes. Paul, and that's, that's probably the most obvious example, but Paul's concerned about these false teachers because they do damage to the church. This blood-bought possession of Christ, false teachers do damage to it. Titus is to appoint faithful elders in the churches of Crete, and then 
work towards shutting down these harmful charlatans. See, Titus can't do it by himself. There's too many churches. The island's too big. We talked about this. You know, Crete is a relatively large island. There are multiple congregations on this island. He can't do it all himself. So he appoints these godly leaders, these godly elders, and then they set about to silence the false teachers. So as we unpack our passage, we're going to see the need for godly elders, the need for godly leaders, and the work that needs to be done to protect God's church from deceivers and abusers. So as we jump in, we'll get right into it. Godly leaders are called to do, and I have my outline is four points. If you look in the bulletin, if you're filling out the blanks, you'll see the four points. But they're called, first off, to restrain destructive teachers. That's the first call. Verses 10 and 11. There are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Even in this early period, there are already teachers. And and Paul says there are many. That's that's frightening. There are many of these teachers going astray and taking people with them. It's bad enough, the going astray, but it's the, hey, follow me, which is doubly damaging because they're taking people down that road with them. Now, there was a natural need for good teaching since the scriptures were currently being written. Uh, I think we've got to the point where we're comfortable. We have a Bible. You know, I, I, can, I can sit down, I can open up my Bible, and I, I, Genesis to Revelation, I can read it. If you ask me a biblical question, I can look it up. Uh, it's in writing, it's on paper, black and white, some red because of the words of Christ. Uh, but it's there. And you put yourself in the first century, though, and these words are being written. They have the written Old Testament, which does, as, as Christ demonstrated, the Old Testament speaks of Christ. The Old Testament is valid and valuable for New Testament believers. But a lot of the New Testament letters hadn't been written yet. The Gospels hadn't been written yet. So these these teachings were being taught orally. They were being taught through words, but they weren't written down. So there's definitely a need for good teaching. Because people cannot just by nature go and look it up. But there were also fraudsters popping up. So not just the natural need for good teaching, but the, but the need to correct error. These fraudsters, the, the, these, these uh, deceivers were insubordinate. It means they were rebellious. They were unwilling to follow sound doctrine. Now that idea of unwilling lends itself to the idea that, that they knew what sound doctrine was and they chose to turn from it. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. But these aren't, aren't accidental false teachers. And we probably all sat under somebody, heard somebody speak, and they didn't know what they were talking about, or they said something incorrect. Uh, that's not what these guys are. These guys aren't just the, the, the novice who probably, you know, you're out over your skis. These guys are actively turning from the truth. And much of this, uh, it says their, their words were empty. They're, they're what's the word? Uh, they're empty talkers. Their words were empty but plenteous. And it is interesting how the people who know the least talk the most. Uh, we see that over and over again. Um, but their words are empty but plenteous. And much of this bad teaching was coming from the circumcision party. And the circumcision party, they, this is a, a, a euphemism here, but uh, they were Jews who were professing to be Christians. So remember, the early church was the majority Jews that had converted to Christianity, had, had, had accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They were of Jewish origin, but they had, 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 were recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. Um, and on Crete, there was actually a very large Jewish population. So much of the early church, these, these, these small congregations, are, are majority Jewish, which, is, which makes sense because they understood, they knew this promise of the Messiah. When you come to preach Jesus, the Messiah, the rescuer, well, they, already, they were prepped for that. They knew the Messiah was coming. So these early churches are, are, are the large percentage of the, of the people are Jewish. And so you have these false teachers who are Jewish, 
claiming to be Christians, but teaching that Jewish believers and even Gentile believers had to follow Jewish laws, had to follow the Jewish customs to be saved. Oh, so you believe in Jesus? Yeah, but you got to follow the dietary law. Oh, you believe in Jesus? Yeah, but you got to follow, you got to, you got to observe the feasts. Oh, you believe in Jesus? Okay, but you got to do these works. Paul's entire letter to the Galatians was about people teaching another gospel, a false gospel, Jesus plus. So these, this circumcision party was causing much of the bad teaching, probably not the, entire, the entirety of the bad teaching, but much of it. And again, there was a natural confusion about blending uh, Jews and Gentiles into this new church. Even uh, you know the, count, the the Jerusalem Council that was that the apostles came to, they had to figure out you know as as Peter was preaching the gospel to Gentiles, and then as Paul really went to Gentiles and 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 Gentiles are becoming Christians, they the, the, the apostles had to come together and work through. Okay, how does that work? What what do we have? What do we expect of these Gentile believers? We don't expect them to become Jews, but I mean this was a, a legitimate thing. And these false teachers were capitalizing on that. Paul says in verse 11, they must be silenced since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. They must be silenced because poisoning God's people cannot be allowed. And that's what they were doing. They were poisoning God's people. What Paul says is there's no playing with these false teachers. There's no allowing them, you know, just messing around with them. You can't do that. They got to be silenced because what they're doing is serious. The Greek word uh, silence carries the meaning of muzzling or even actively plugging the mouth of somebody. I mean, that, I mean, this is not a uh, this isn't a a weak word there's a there's a power there's a there's an aggressiveness to this word you got to silence that and they have to be silenced because these people are peddling poison and i I think think it's interesting because paul doesn't say that everybody needs to be silenced when when in philippians 1 paul talks about gospel preachers who are preaching with the wrong intentions and we've, we've talked about this in the past with, in Philippians. There were a group of people that Paul was imprisoned, and they were preaching the gospel, and they were hoping to, again, I use this phrase, building their brands. They were, they were preaching the gospel, trying to get followings, but they were preaching the gospel. And this is what Paul says in Philippians 1. He says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So these aren't good guys. These guys are, they they know, you know, Paul's the starter, but he's on the bench right now. So they're looking to get their shot. They're trying to build up their name, their following. And Paul says in verse 18 of Philippians 1, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul does not say these guys need to be silenced. He says they're preaching the gospel. I don't care why they're preaching the gospel. I'm fine with the gospel being preached, the real, true gospel. But then he says these guys in Crete need to be silenced. What's the difference? Well, these guys aren't preaching the gospel. These guys have twisted the gospel. They've twisted everything to the point where uh, this isn't this isn't truth anymore. This is poison. These people are not teaching the life-giving gospel with with wrong motives. They're pouring poison down the throats of God's people. He says they're upsetting families. They're upsetting whole families. They're destroying that this word literally means they're destroying, they're overturning, they're ruining families. Um, this word upset, almost like the word offend, we, uh, we use that so frequently in our culture. Um, I'm offended at this, or I'm upset. The, the, the Greek word behind upset literally means to destroy, literally means to 
overturn. It means to ruin. This is serious what these guys are doing. These are, are false teachers who are, are damaging families. Well, what is a church made of? You know, we talk about the family of Christ, but what is a church is made up of individual families that come together. And so these false teachers, what they're doing is they are they're targeting the individual families that build the church up. And they're trying to wreck them and ruin them and twist them. Acts 20, verse uh, 29 and 30 says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So there's this understanding that there's going to be people that come in. One of the issues with, uh, with Christians because we seek truth, we tend to be trusting. And so someone comes in and says, hey, I'm one of you. And I don't know how many, you, you guys have all probably had, I've had this multiple times where I was working with some business. You know, either, I, probably the best example is I had an insurance guy. So we had a guy come to the house, he's doing life insurance. And we mentioned that we were Christian school teachers at the time. We were, we were you know, we worked at this Baptist school. And lo and behold, my insurance guy was, he's a Christian too. Couldn't tell, him, couldn't, couldn't tell us what church he went to, but he was a Christian too. I'm one of you guys. So sign this paperwork so I can make some money, right? And we probably all had that, where someone claimed to be a Christian too. But of course, that hope that, that we're, we're, we're trusting. One of the challenges, I think, for the Christian is we have to have some discernment. And what we see here is that these... Uh, um, wolf, you, this is a harsh term, wolves will come into the church seeking to, to, to wreck, to eat, to, de, to de devour. False teaching has dire consequences. Families are ruined. Truth is hidden. Hope is lost. And probably the biggest thing is God's name is belittled. That's, that's what false teachers do. That's the damage. They take this holy name of God, what, what Jesus is the name above all names. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. At some point, everyone will, will, will recognize Jesus as Lord. And they take this name and they belittle it. They twist it. They, 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 they muddy it. So they must be silenced. They must be restrained. That's the first job of the of the godly leaders of, 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 a, of a mature church. So godly leaders are to silence false teachers, and they're also to rebuke drifting Christ followers. Rebuke drifting Christ followers. Paul says in verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He says this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may sound... They may be sound in the faith. I think it's interesting that he, he's like, yeah, yeah, these, these Cretans are just terrible. Um, I think somebody might call, say, Paul's a racist here, I don't know. But um, the, the, the Cretan culture had definitely developed, there was a stereotype, and it was an earned stereotype. Uh, false teachers and charlatans direct people away from Christ but godly leaders are to point God's people back to their Savior. That's the challenge here. That's the reason for the rebuke. So the, so the Cretans had developed a reputation for dishonesty to the point that in the Roman world, Cretanize meant to lie. Um, we talk sometimes about the, the, the Corinthians. Uh, uh, to, to Corinthize meant to be debauched. To Cretanize meant to lie. That, that was the culture that they had, they had developed, they had earned. Paul talks about this prophet of theirs. It was a man named uh, Epimenides, and he lived about 600 years before Paul's writing here. So about 600 B.C. is when this guy, this guy lived. And the culture hadn't changed, hadn't gotten any better down through time. In the Corinthian, or I'm sorry, the, the Cretan culture, Wickedness was not just tolerated, it was expected. And it wasn't just expected, it was even encouraged. That's the culture 
these Christians were living in. That's the culture that these Christians were saved out of. And, and most of you guys who, especially if you were saved as an adult, and I love the, uh, I love the salvation testimony of adults. You know, I, I, I love when little kids get saved. I, was, I became a believer at five years old. I grew up in a Christian home and, and, and came to faith at five. That's a wonderful testimony. I love hearing people say they, 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 were, they became Christians when they were children. But man, I love hearing the testimonies of adults who got saved. Because they know what they got saved from. They, they have a good memory of their life before salvation. These Cretans, Cretans, got, they were saved out of this culture. And you know that uh, you don't just shed every, all the baggage of your culture. You know, if you, sometimes we'll hear the, the, the stories of someone who got saved. You know, an alcoholic got saved, and I never desire to drink again. Or a, a drug addict got saved, and I never, I never had a desire. My, my addiction was gone. And so, that does happen sometimes, but that's not always. I've known godly men and women who got saved, and they battled addictions, and they battled difficulties. And even, even maybe less stark than that, we still have the teachings. We still have the things we were taught as, as young people growing up. And the same thing with these Cretans. They were, they were um, still products of this wicked culture. They had been saved. They were growing in their faith, but they still had a lot of that baggage left. So Paul says that these, these Cretans are always liars. He calls them evil beasts. The idea of lives run by sinful appetites and passions. Much of our culture could be referred to as that. He calls them lazy gluttons. The idea of self-indulgence, greed. They desire to eat but not to work. Again, we see a lot of that in our culture today. So Titus and his appointed leaders are, are called to rebuke these Cretans. And rebuke is a strong word. I mean, none, nothing that Paul says here in this passage is weak. None of this is, is uh, uh, milk toast or, or, or lily liver. This is, this is some strong language that Paul is using. He says rebuke. And that word in the Greek literally means to convict. It, it means to demand an expl explanation. It's to call someone on the carpet and tell them, look what you did. Why did you do this? There's a strength to it. And he doesn't say just to, he doesn't just say to uh, rebuke them, but rebuke them sharply. And that adds a whole other layer to this. Because that literally means to cut with a knife. You know, there's, there's probably the picture of a surgery here. Not so much of a stabbing, but of a surgery. Because this is what God's word does in the sinning heart. This is what, how God describes his own word. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is, a lot, is, is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Um, used properly in its context, God's word cuts deeply like a scalpel, revealing sin and cutting it out. I mean, that's what God's word does. As I, as I pour God's word into my life, as I read God's word, as I get to know him better, his word is going to cut into my life. It's going to cut out those, those sins. And this is why our teaching, this is why our corrections must come from the Bible, must come from Scripture. I'm not smart enough to teach and correct apart from God's word nor are you. We have to stick with God's word. That's where the power is. 2 Timothy 4, Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So he's supposed to, he's supposed to reprove, rebuke, exhort, but through the word. That's where the power is. That's where God works. Timothy and Titus are not called on to use their stellar personalities, their rapier-like wit. They're called to preach the word and let God's word work. The point of this rebuke is to bring Christ followers back into line with Christ. Because these, 
these damaging teachers had drawn believers away from God. Uh, sometimes I use this illustration of, you know, use the word Christ follower. How do you know if someone's following Christ? Well, if he's, or how, how do you know if someone is a Christ follower if he's following Christ, right? How do you know a kid is playing follow the leader? If he's, play, if he's actually following the leader. The kid sitting off in the corner isn't playing follow the leader. How do we know? Because he's not following the leader. These Christ followers had gotten drawn away from following Christ. The point of the rebuke and as a as a pastor in a church, you know, that's never if you ever if you have a pastor that likes rebuking people, that's probably a dangerous thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, there there are times, but uh, for the most part, we you know, pastors, church leaders, nobody, we don't like to rebuke anybody. We don't want to have to especially rebuke sharply. But if you have to be rebuked at some point, the purpose is to bring you back in line with Christ. Come back, in, not in line with me, not in line with our church tradition, but in line with Christ. So part of getting Christians back to sound and healthy doctrine, because that's the point here, getting back into sound, healthy doctrine. Verse 14 talks about to reject unbiblical doctrines. Part of getting Christians back to following Christ is to reject unbiblical doctrines. Verse 14, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. So godly leaders need to try to prevent evil ideas from developing. This is a big thing. Not just dealing with the false teaching when it comes up, but actively trying to prevent evil ideas from developing. Well, how do we do that? But we teach God's word. If I, if I can teach you well enough, if, if you can learn God's word well enough to recognize false teaching, when you turn on the TV and you see that uh, the TV preacher there and you recognize, oh, he's a heretic. Ah, click, turn him off, right? That's the goal, is that you recognize false teachers when you see them. Verse 14 says, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths. The, the, the law that we read in the Old Testament, this is one of the things that, again, there was a large Jewish population on Crete, and they had their religious ideas. And I think sometimes we make the error of thinking that Judaism and the Old Testament are the same thing. But the law that we read in the Old Testament, and you, and you can read the entire Old Testament, and the first century Judaism that we see in the New Testament had very little in common. They really did. Um, almost everything, when, you, when the, the, the Judaism that Jesus interacted with, the Pharisees, where are they in the Old Testament? They're not. They had developed during the, uh, during the, the exile. The... Uh, um, the places of worship, you know, there, there's the temple, certainly, but the, the other places of worship, they had developed during, during the, uh, uh, the, the synagogues, they had developed during the, uh, the, 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 the captivity. Much of their doctrines had been added over the course of centuries. Jewish leaders had, for centuries, added rules and regulations to the point of creating essentially a different religion. And that's a, that's a big thing to understand. Because Jesus, when Jesus was teaching, Jesus never contradicted God's word. But left and right, he contradicted what the scribes and the Pharisees said. You say this, but it's written. Um, this, was very, this, is a, this is a completely different religion. The externals were there, certainly. They celebrated the feast, they used the right words, but they had created a works-based system that they used to control people. We see this with uh, the Pharisees. Uh, there's an expression in, um, that's used in the New Testament. There was a Sabbath day's journey. And if you ever heard that, that expression, you wonder, what it was that? Because what did God say? God set, told people to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't work on the Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. You, you rest and remember what God did. It's, it's supposed to be a day that you look forward to because you don't have to work. 
and you get to remember the God who created you and saved you. But they had turned it into a, a complicated system of, if you pick this thing up, that's work, and you're in, you're in violation. If you do this. So they had a Sabbath day's journey, because you had to be able to walk. But if you walk too far, that would be work. So it was a, I think it was a 1,000 paces. You got to travel a 1,000 paces. That was a Sabbath day's journey. That wasn't work. But 1,001, that was work. And they had this whole big regu- rules and regulations that turned into, rather than worshiping the God who created them, they were now worshiping the rules and regulations. It was a workspace system. And it was designed to control the people. In addition, there were Jewish mystics that got weird <laughs> with numerology and spirituality. There was this whole, whole group of, of Jewish mystics. Uh, numerology in Hebrew was, is fascinating because Hebrew did not have numbers. They didn't have numeral numbers. And so they, anytime you have Old Testament talking about numbers, they ascribed a value to letters. And so names had different numerical values. And it's a system, fine. But over the years, they had changed that into, that became a very mystical numerology, uh, almost astrology kind of thing, where names had special meanings because of their numerical value. And sometimes you see that even today. Um, so they had this whole, whole litany of false doctrine that was going on. And, and, and Jesus, as he's dealing with these people, with the, the, these Jewish leaders, he had strong words for the Jewish religious leaders. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte or a convert. And when he becomes a proselyte, when he becomes a convert, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Jesus didn't hold back. He says, your belief system is wicked. It's sending people to hell. You are headed to hell, and everyone you convert, you are, you are doubly convicting them. You're pulling them out of their paganism, but you're putting them into another hell-bound system. And on Crete, there was much of the same mentality. Re- religious con men had rejected the true faith. Uh, he says they've turned away uh, the devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Turn away carries the idea of an active decision. These guys chose to turn away from the truth. And they were trying to build their brands at the expense of these young believers in the Cretan church. So godly leaders and a mature godly or a mature congregation need to be on guard to weed out any unbiblical teaching they find. As we see some unbiblical teaching, we need to recognize that and and correct that. We can't allow uh, uh, false doctrines to take root in the church. And again, that can be a a full-time job. Especially, uh, you know, if you go to the Christian bookstore, which I don't know if there's any Christian bookstores that still exist. There's one in Noblesville. There, there, There is one. Um, there used to be Christian bookstores all over the place. But you go into those bookstores, and half the books on the shelves are pagan. Now, they claim to be Christian, but they're pagan. They're fal- they're, a lot of false doctrine was sold in Christian bookstores. So I don't, I don't shed too many tears over the closing of Christian bookstores. But there's always a new charlatan who's writing a book telling you the new system. Oh, we've, we've found the new system, the, the true meaning of the Bible. So we've got to weed those out. We've got to recognize them and avoid them. Finally, after restraining destructive teachers, rebuking drifting Christians, and rejecting unbiblical doctrines, godly leaders, godly leaders need to reveal differing spiritual states. Verses 15 and 16. This is probably the most well-known verse of, of this section. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. We have to present a clear distinction between 
pure and impure. And that's big because because our world again will will blur that line. I mean, this is what we see in the Garden of Eden with the serpent. The serpent tells Eve, you know, hey, why don't you eat that this piece of fruit? Well, God says we can't. Well, He knows that if you do, you you'll be like Him. Oh, it's a good it's good to eat. It's good for food. And He blurs that line. That should have been a stark good and bad. Don't eat the piece of fruit as opposed to do eat the piece of fruit. But it got that 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 differing spiritual states were blurred, and we need to present a clear distinction between pure and impure. These destructive teachers were presenting themselves as pure gospel ministers, but their actions and their attitudes told another story. Everything they did was twisted and perverse. They were entirely unfit and unable to serve God because they were unbelieving and defiled in their lostness. That's that's profound. Because he's not saying these are believers that are just in error or believers that just interpret the wrong way. These are lost people. These are these are people who don't know God. They don't know the gospel. I always think it's interesting uh, if if you do any study on Islam and I don't want to spend too much time talking about Islam. But if you read about Allah, Allah is a fictional invention from a guy, Muhammad, who knew something about the real God of the Bible and tried to draw a picture. Like, it's like if I go into the Louvre and I see the Mona Lisa and then I walk away and I draw the Mona Lisa, you might, if you squint just right, you might look at my drawing and go, oh, that's, that's supposed to be the Mona Lisa. But it ain't going to be right. It's not going to have all the details. There's, there's not, it's not going to be accurate. It's going to be similar. And that's what you see with Allah in Islam. He's a caricature of the, of the God of the Bible. And what we see here are these unbelieving Christian teachers who don't know the God of the Bible, don't know sound doctrine, but they're making a caricature of it. So some of it sounds relatively convincing. Well, maybe that's true. That's what's happening here. And there's no clear presentation between good and evil. There's, no, there's not a clear recognition of the gospel and not the gospel. Again, Jesus discussed this with the Jewish religious leaders. In Luke 11, he says, While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at table. Now, the Pharisees were not Jesus' friends. And the fact that Jesus went in to dine, he's, 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 he knows this is coming. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not wash first before dinner. There was a ceremonial washing. So Jesus didn't just sit down with grubby hands, but he didn't do the ceremonial washing. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? So the Pharisees, their, their, their works-based religion was only concerned with the externals. That's all. You look the part. They had the right haircuts. They dressed the right way. They said the right words. They looked the part, but they didn't address sinful hearts at all. They actually encouraged the sinful hearts. They encouraged pride and arrogance. Jesus says this in Matthew 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. The King James says, whited sepulchers. That's my favorite. The whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. That's the picture of these, these Pharisees and these, these circumcision party, these destructive teachers that were claiming to be Christian. The same thing. You're whitewashed tombs. You, you look good on the outside, but inside you're full of uncleanness you're full of wickedness it's important for us to understand our outside doesn't determine our inside and that's what the pharisees were teaching that's what the circumcision party was teaching 
outside, a, a, a facade of purity, a facade of Christianity. It doesn't matter what the inside is. The false front, though, is just that. It's false. If you ever look at a movie set, you know, you know those old westerns where you have the, uh, you have the, the, the town and the, the cowboy rides down the street in the town, and you got all these buildings, and if you're able to walk around behind, there's no building. It's a false front. It just it, it isn't real, and it works for a movie. But you can't live your life like that. You can't live a false-fronted life. And that's what these false teachers were doing. That's what they were encouraging. Purity comes from within as our hearts are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Purity then moves outward into our actions and our attitudes. That's the idea of, to the pure, all things are pure. As, as, my, as my heart is purified through the gospel of Jesus Christ, I trust Christ, I come to faith. That purity extends outward into my actions and attitudes. This is not a permission to live in sin because, well, I'm pure, so everything I can do is pure. That's the argument of the impure. But as... As, as you get to know God better, that purity of heart moves toward the outside. It moves into the actions and attitudes. God never gives his children permission to sin, so, so don't read it that way. But this is what, what Paul says to the Corinthians. And again, the Corinthians were very much like the, uh, the Cretans. In 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 9, Paul gives this list of sins, and, and I don't want you to get caught up on the whole list of sins. The point is that these were, these were bad things. So, so do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that would be harsh if that's where that ended. But verse 11 says, and such were some of you. You notice the were. Such were some of you. He's talking to the Corinthians because this is the culture they came from. He says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And this is the beauty of the faith. None of the Corinthians, none of the Cretans, None of the Prairie Baptists, whatever you ever say, none of us can say that we weren't any of those things. Oh, no, I'm not a sinner. I was never a sinner. No, you are. You were a sinner. You were lost in your sins, headed to hell. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. That's where the purity comes from. Not because you're somehow better than the rest of the world. And it's easy to look at, you know, you turn on the news and you can look at this world imploding and go, those idiots. Understand that we're the same. What's the difference? It's the purity that Christ's blood brought. Purity comes first through having your sins forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ. It then progresses as you grow and mature in your faith. You strive to think godly thoughts and do godly acts. And this is what we call sanctification, the progressive development of the Christian mind and life. The Christ follower can and should strive for purity, but the lost person can't. These, these false teachers, these destructive teachers that, that Paul is talking about, but even the, the, the lost in general can't be pure. Their, their heart is defiled. The unbeliever is defiled in his sin. His actions deny God, who is the only hope for sinners. But there is hope. There is hope. As we, as we have this entire passage on, on just the dangers and the damage being done by false teachers, you might think, man, it's hopeless. All oh, this is negative. It's, 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 it's doom and gloom, but except there is hope. A major reason, the major region, reason for godly teachers, godly leaders taking God's church and God's gospel so seriously is so that we can share the pure, life-giving gospel with the lost word. Why, why does Paul take it so seriously? These, 
these requirements for godly leaders. Why, do, why, why does the Bible take so seriously Christians living godly lives? Well, so that we can share the gospel with the lost world. We can demonstrate, we can be that city on a hill. We know that Jesus is the light of the world. But he gives us, us that responsibility to share the gospel. That's where the hope is. We live, we take this seriously. We live, we strive to live a pure godly life so that we can take the gospel to the world around us. The sinner can repent. He can reject his sin today. He can place his trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation today. He can stand justified, and justified means not guilty. Imagine standing before God, knowing what you are. You know, I know what I am. And he's going to declare me not guilty. Not because he's forgot what I've done. Not because he doesn't know who I am. But because he sees me through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But the sinner can stand justified before the throne of God. Through and only through the shed blood of Jesus. The church is a serious matter. And it must be guarded by godly leaders. And by mature congregations. Please, please don't read that the only, the only one responsible is the pastor of the church. You do have godly leaders, but you also have mature congregations that need to be recognizing false teaching. Pushing, provoking each other to righteousness. We must be ready to address and stop destructive teaching. We must be ready to point fellow believers back towards Christ. And we must be ready to clearly show lost men and women the hope that only comes from Jesus. I'm going to ask Karen to come up to play the piano to close out our service. I just want to give you a moment to respond to God's word. If you're here and you're a believer, you're a Christ follower, you've put your faith in Christ alone. Let me challenge you. Are you growing in your faith? Are you striving to know the truth in God's word? Or are you getting carried away with false teaching? Are these TV preachers or some of these guys who write the books, are they influencing your thinking? Do you need to develop discernment to recognize truth from error? Well, take a moment, speak to God, pray for wisdom. If you need to confess sin, do that. But ask God for wisdom in living out this godly life. Perhaps commit to reading God's word, getting in God's word, so that you can see the truth. And maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. Maybe you're not a believer. You have never put your faith in Christ. Would you pray today, ask God to open your eyes to the truth? Would you ask God to, to reveal himself to you in a way that you could see your need for salvation? Perhaps you, put, you need to put your trust in Christ today and just simply need to put your, your trust in Christ this, at this moment. Take a moment and pray.